Hey everyone, Professor Hank here. So today we're gonna to take a look at the three fundamental repetition structures in Java, and they are the for loop, the while loop, and the do while loop. So before we get started, here's a quick spoiler alert. If you're familiar with C++, it's exactly the same. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Otherwise, if you're not, stick around and we'll go through each of these and look at some examples as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we will look at is we will take a look at the while loop. And the while loop is a uh, pre-test loop that means that you're going to have a test expression and so long as that test expression is true you'll have a repetition of the loop but it has to be true in order for you to have any repetitions at all so here's what the syntax looks like for this pre-test loop you have the keyword while and then you have a test expression and then you've got a statement or block of statements that follows it um, immediately okay so so long as what's inside of this test expression evaluates to true, then the body of the loop is going to execute. So the statement or statements in here is going to execute. So let's take a look at an example. So let's say that we wanted to have a while loop that uh, displayed the values one through 10. So what we would do is we would set up a counter variable and we could initialize that to say one. So this is our counter variable. And then we'll have that while keyword and we'll have a test. And so I'll say so long as I is less than or equal to 10, then we're going to do something. So what are we going to do? We're going to print out the contents of uh, I. But there's one last thing that we have to remember here, and that is that we have to increment our i here. Okay, so let's just do i++ to make that happen. So let's see what that looks like, and then we will talk about a couple of the details here. Okay, so you can see in the output, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I started off set to one. And so when we came to this loop here, I less than or equal to 10. Well, I contains one initially because we initialized I to one. Is one less than or equal to 10? That's true. So we enter the body of the loop. We print out the contents of I and then we increment I, right? So we added one to I. And so then as soon as we did that, I contained two. We went back up to the top of the loop and we did our test again. Is two less than or equal to 10? True, so we entered the body of the loop, printed out the contents of i, and then added one to i. And we just kept doing that over and over again until this test expression became false. When was that test expression false? When i contained 10 and this evaluated to true, we entered the loop, printed out the 10, and then added one to i, so that became 11. So that at the top of the loop, 11 is not less than or equal to 10, that's false. So the loop's done and then we finished the program. We continued on with the program and finished it off, right? So we'll put a little system.out.println goodbye here just to make it a little bit easier to see that fact. So we'll run that again and then we'll take a look at what it means for it to be a pre-test loop, right? So there's the one through 10 and then the goodbye. So a pre-test loop, let's say that I had initialized I to 13 instead. Well, I contains 13, so when we get to this test, expression here, i contains 13. Is 13 less than or equal to 10? No. So this is going to be false. So this loop will never iterate. So the body of the loop will not execute at all because this is false. The body of the loop will never get entered. So it'll get skipped and then we'll print out the goodbye. And so you'll see that right here. Okay. So there you go. All you see is the goodbye. Now it's important to keep in mind also that you have to make sure that there's something that causes your test expression to evaluate the false. What causes that here is the I goes up by one each repetition. And so eventually once I is 11, then that causes this test expression to be false and causes the loop to terminate. Without that, you would end up with an infinite loop, right? So if we comment that out, then there's nothing to stop this test expression of ever evaluating to um, false because the I never changes. So it remains one all the time in the run of the program. And so this will remain true. This test expression will always be true. And so the loop will just keep going on and on and on and on. So you have to make sure that you have something in the body of your loop to cause that test expression to eventually evaluate to false. Now, of course, we could change what we initialize our I to here, let's say three, and then we could change our update statement here to maybe add three each time. And then maybe we change our test to say so long as i is less than or equal to 33, right? And so that's gonna impact 
you know, what we see in the output, how many repetitions we actually have. So you can see here that I is starting off at three and then it's being increased by three each time. And so we're printing out that contents of I until it gets to 33. So when I contains 33, 33 is less than or equal to 33. We print out the contents of I, add three to that 33 to that I. So that becomes 36. When we go back up to the top of the loop, then, you know, I contains 36. 36 is not less than or equal to 33, so that's false. So then the loop terminates, it breaks out. So we don't have an infinite loop situation right there. So while loops are good uh, to have or to use when you are not sure exactly how many iterations of the loop or how many repetitions you're going to need ahead of time. So let me give you an example of that. So you can use loops to do input validation. So here's an example of input validation. And so what we'll do is we'll ask the user, to enter in a number, right? So enter a positive number. So we want a number that is greater than zero, right? So then we will read using a scanner object. So we'll do scanner input equals new scanner. And we're going to be reading from standard in. And so then we will read the response from the user into using our scanner, right? So we'll do input dot uh, next int. And then we'll read that into a variable called uh, num. And then we will change our test expression to say, well, so long as num is less than or equal to zero. So long as that is true, then we're going to enter the body of the loop. We want to catch that invalid input. So we'll do something like, you know, system.out.println error input must be positive. Try again. And then we'll just repeat this little statement here, right? We'll just tell them to give us the number again, and then we'll read the number in one more time. And so we don't know ahead of time exactly what they're going to give us. So we want to have this repeat as often as necessary. We want to catch the user here whenever they give us a number that's zero or less. And so we don't know how many times that's going to be. So the while loop can continue executing over and over and over and over again until they give us what we want. So let's take a look at what that could look like. Instead of entering in positive number, I'll enter in like negative five, right? So you can see the output error, input must be positive, try again. So I do negative three, must be positive, try again, zero, must be positive, try again. I can keep doing this all day long. I don't know ahead of time how many repetitions that I needed, right? Because the user can just keep on typing in invalid input. And we don't break out of that loop until they actually give me something that is valid, in which case that's a positive number. Okay, so that's an example of using a loop when you don't know how many repetitions you're going to need ahead of time. So let's go ahead and take a look at the do while loop. And this thing is different from a while loop in that it's going to guarantee that you have at least one repetition. So it looks like this. It's got a syntax that's like this. So you have the do keyword. You have your block and then you have the while key word and then your test expression after that with a little semicolon here at the end. Don't forget the semicolon. It's easy to forget. We don't have that with the while loop, right? So while test, there's no semicolon after that test expression with a while loop, but there is with the do while loop. So let's have an example of this thing. So we'll do something like do and then we'll do while and this is good for if you have, say, a menu-driven program because you want to at least show that menu to the user one time, right? So maybe we have something like this. I'll just keep it simple for the example, but, you know, imagine this is the menu, okay? And then we might give them a prompt to tell them to enter the choice. Enter your choice. And then maybe we say something like Q to quit. Okay, so this would show the menu at least one time and they would give the user the option to give us at least one response. And so then maybe um, we ask the user for a character. So we would need to have a scanner object again equals new scanner and we're reading from system in. And so then here we might have a character variable. So we'll say character choice. Okay, so we'll read that next character. So we'll do input dot next line and then we'll do dot there at the very first element so what next line does is that reads an entire string and so then this care at right here is going to specify that we want the first character from that line 
and then what it's going to return we will put into our choice variable okay so then we will say that we're going to continue doing this loop so long as that choice does not equal q right so let's go ahead and see what that looks like so we'll compile that and you're going to see that the loop's just going to dive right in right it's a post test loop the test doesn't happen until afterwards so you can see the output says imagine this is the menu so if we had a menu we'd present, be presented with some choices and then we have a prompt to enter the choice so if i enter anything other than q right so maybe i do um, g right then that choice that g is not equal to uppercase q so if we go back we have another repetition so then you see you know the menu prompt here you see this line that says imagine this is the menu that would be your menu then we get the choice again and so then maybe this time we type in, you know, like M, maybe that was an option for one of the many choices. And so since M does not equal Q, we go and we have another repetition. So this just keeps going over and over and over again until we actually enter something that causes this test to evaluate to false. So to make it evaluate to false, we would actually enter in Q. And so that causes the loop to terminate because it says here, while well, choice does not equal Q, well, since I entered Q, choice does equal Q, Q does equal Q, so that's false. The loop breaks out. We continue with the program. The only thing left in the program is to say goodbye. So that's an example of the do while loop. And again, it's useful if you want to have at least one repetition. Okay, so let's take a look at the last repetition structure that we have to choose from. And that's going to be the for loop. And the for loop is going to be a pretest loop, similar to the while loop. And the for loop works very similarly to a while loop. Matter of fact, you can make them completely logically equivalent. It's just a maybe a shorter hand way of writing a while loop. So we have that for keyword, and then you have parentheses. And then inside these parentheses here, there's three separate sections. You've got an initialization expression here. So you might do something like int i equals zero. And then you have your test expression here. So this is your test. So you might do something like i less than 10. So then you have in this last part, an update expression. So maybe like i plus plus or i, I plus equals three or whatever you need. So this is your update. So you've got your init, your test, and your update so init test and update and so then immediately after that you have a statement or block of statements so you can put whatever you need to have repeated inside that block so let's take a look at this guy this is a great loop to have when you know ahead of time exactly how many repetitions you're going to need because of the way that it's designed right so for example if i knew that i wanted to have exactly 10 repetitions I could say for anti equals zero, i less than 10, i plus plus. So I've got my initialization, I've got my test, and I've got my update. Okay, so what I'll have this do is I'll have it just print out, you know, i squared for zero through nine. So system.out.println, we'll say i plus, and we'll say squared equals, and then we'll do plus i times i, something like that, okay? So if I wanted to show zero through nine squared, this would do it. So let's see what that would look like. Because there's gonna be 10 repetitions. So you can see there's the first repetition, zero squared equals zero. There's the second repetition, one squared equals one. The third repetition, two squared equals four, and so on until we get to nine squared equals 81. Now that's 10 repetitions because we started at zero and we went up to, but we did not include 10. Okay. Now, if I wanted to go one through 10, well, then I would just change this to one and I could make that less than or equal to 10. So then we'll start from one and then we'll go all the way through 10. And so as soon as I is equal to 11, then that's going to make it false, similar to what we saw with the while loop. So here we go. So now you can see we go one squared equals one, two squared equals four and so on until we get to 10 squared equals 100. Okay, you can tweak with this in all kinds of different ways. You know, we could initialize the i to three, just like we did with the while loop. Uh, we could set i less than or equal to 33, just like we did. And then we could change the i instead of getting incremented to be increased by three, right? So you have all these little knobs that you can tweak to get exactly the kind of results that you need from your loop. And so now you can see that we went up by three each time, three, six, nine, 12, all the way through 33. Now, something else to point out to you here is that 
you can have multiple uh, items in your update expression here. So let's say that I wanted to do something like this. I'll just do a silly example. So let's say that I wanted to create uh, two separate variables and I'd say it's I equals zero and J equals two. And so, or I equals one and J equals two. And so what I'll do is I will have this first expression left out because you can leave these things out. You don't have to have them. Since I defined my I and my J up here, I could leave this out right here, right? Or I could declare my I and my J before the loop, and then I could do my initialization within the loop. I equals zero, J equals uh, one, right? Or I equals one and J equals two. And so I can say, so long as I is less than or equal to 33, um, we'll increment I by three, and we'll increment J by two. Okay, so maybe what I'll do here is I will just display the contents of I and J as the loop progresses. So maybe I might say I equals, and then do plus I plus J equals, build me a little string here that just displays the contents of both of those variables. And so then I can, run that and you'll see that the i is going to get incremented by three each time it'll start off at one became four seven ten thirteen sixteen nineteen etc all the way up until it's 31 you don't see the 33 because when it was 28 it got incremented by three to 31 and then when it was 31 it got incremented by three up to 34. so as soon as the i became 34 well 34 is not less than or equal to 33 so we broke out of the loop the loops over right because this is false but you'll see that the j is also getting updated as a result of this update expression right here, right? So you can make this stuff as complex as you want. Okay, so now something to notice is that since we've got the I and the J defined before the for loop, that means that the scope of those two variables goes past the for loop. So we can access them from within the for loop, sure, but we can also access them after the for loop. So we might do something like this. We might say int sum equals I plus J. And then we could say system.out.println the sum of i and j is, and then we can print out that sum, right? So we can access, the point is, is that we can access those variables after the for loop, okay? So you can see that there's the sum of the two. Now, if uh, I hadn't declared them here, then I'd only be able to use them within the loop itself. So let's say I do something like this. I say int i equals one, j equals two then the scope of those variables is only within the for loop of itself see how the i and the j has got the red squiggly underneath it now it's because they're out of scope if you define the variables within the for loop here itself within that initialization portion then you can only use the i and the j within the loop itself so we're not able to use them um, here so um, you can see that you have all kinds of different options and you can make the test expression as complex as you want. You could have said, well, for as long as I is less than or equal to 33 and J is greater than zero, for example, right? You can make this test expression as complex as you need it to be or as simple as you need it to be. And you can do all kinds of combination. Okay, so that's everything that I want to cover in this video. So we took a look at the three different types of repetition structures, a while loop, a do while loop, and a for loop. We saw examples of each and when each of them might be useful. As usual, if you're a student of mine and you have any questions about anything that we covered in this video, feel free to stop by my Zoom office hours or to send me an email via Canvas. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.